Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sober is Dope podcast with your host, Pop Buchanan. Today, I want to talk about various topics regarding mental health. And um, this is a continuation of our mental health series. And it's very important because I feel like mental health is growing around the world between technology, the media, environmental issues, um, stress, just life, fear. So I just want to just to do a basic episode, just letting everyone out there know that you're not alone. That's the most important thing. I think when I speak to anyone that's dealing with mental health, there's an array of different emotions that arise and feelings. And sometimes people may feel isolated as if no one will understand them. Sometimes people don't even identify with the actual traditional mental health diagnoses like they may be feeling symptoms of depression but may not be calling it depression they may just be feeling like they have this unique problem and I just want to let everyone out there know if you're listening you're not alone for years I dealt with mental health and I didn't understand that until looking backwards on my life and remembering how I felt when I was in my um, addiction and just the different emotions that I had, how I dealt with them, especially how I dealt with loss and depression or just like disappointment. And, um, you know, I would totally just cover it up by just drinking like perpetually until I felt better. And it would or until that whole problem just was removed until I fixed it. So, for example, if I was experiencing depression because I lost a friend and we fell out in a really bad way, I would just drink until I found another friend to fill that void. But I realized that the actual initial depression and sadness from the friend that I lost, that never really went away unless I addressed it. So I think that as humanity, we tend to run a lot from our issues We tend to run away from the things that we're afraid of, and we tend to run away from our problems a lot, thinking that by running, we can kind of ignore them, or they'll go away on their own, and somehow they just come back and haunt us. So my biggest thing was facing your fears, facing your problems head on, and that could be as simple as just talking about it. It may not be about confronting your actual the actual problem or the actual person or the actual stressor, but maybe confiding in a person saying, hey, I'm having issues with this person. What do you think I should do? You know, developing a support system. So that's very important. Um, I want to read some notes that I have from some articles that I, you know, found online. This one is called, why do I feel anxious? And I think that this is a good start because most people may feel the emotion and the uh, response of anxiety, but may not know how to identify it. So let's look into this a little bit and see where this takes us. Anxiety UK say 13 of 16 to 19 year olds have suffered from anxiety, rising to 16 percent of 20 to 24 year olds. It can occur when a person regularly feels disproportionate levels of distress, worry, or fear over a certain issue, all right? So we have fear here, all right? So if you're feeling anxious and the actual fear starts to rise to an unhealthy level, then that means that your anxiety can go up. Um... Professor John said, if a person is feeling anxious, they need a plan to calm themselves down, be it making a playlist or doing a crossword. So let's take this slowly, guys, because I don't want to run through this too fast. So if you're feeling anxious and it may be due to fear, maybe environmental fear, maybe fear that you're not going to be able to pay your bills on time, maybe fear that your spouse is cheating on you, maybe fear that you're inadequate in some way, or just overall fear. You may be fearful of your neighborhood, your environment, the news. It could be anything, right? But you have to try to plan how you're going to calm yourself down when fear arises, okay? So if you notice that your anxiety is increasing, identify 
what in your life you're probably fearful of or worrying excessively about and then have a system of calming yourself down um, we have an episode called the 90 second rule which deactivates the fight or flight response that we get when we are afraid or anxious um, as we know from a mental health perspective most of our emotions and feelings are it deals with our hormones right and these neurotransmitter hormones or chemicals so for example if you have a heightened state of fear or anxiety that's literally your body releasing excess cortisol and adrenaline because it's preparing itself to either f run or fight so imagine if you know, you see some crazy person coming towards you and you see what may appear to be a gun and then you hear someone scream. Your initial response is going to be to either run. But if you can't, you're going to be you're going to be in a posture to either fight or you're going to be very tense in a defensive position. This is the fight or flight mechanism. You know, it's a primitive response that our brain developed to protect us millions of years ago so you know when dinosaurs was around or if anything environmental factors we developed this fight or flight response so we could sense danger and protect ourselves and get ourselves out of the way but you know minor stresses or maybe things that's not as extreme as a gigantic dinosaur or some crazy guy with a gun can still activate your fight or flight response okay so it could be your stress you could get a um a bad message from someone that you love maybe your boyfriend or girlfriend and that could incite fear right and that fear can lead to excess anxiety but that will still be the release of cortisol and adrenaline in your system so that feelings these emotions are chemically um response which they chemically respond to your external environment so my thing would be with saying all of that saying all of that so anyone out there that may be struggling you know if you're feeling these emotions this is what's happening you have to be really good at trying to calm yourself down so what does that mean have a go-to musical playlist that you can listen to to relax you. <sighs> take a moment and take a deep breath like I just did. Take a moment. Breathe in, breathe out. Try to get your breathing under control. We tend to stop breathing when we have heightened anxiety, right? Um, okay, so we have something called um, your... Um, your um, we, it's like I said, I'm sorry, guys. We tend to just stop breathing. So your secondary breathing system kicks in. Um, your parasympathetic system. I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of this term off the top of my head. So when we are in a heightened state of anxiety, we tend to forget to breathe. And our parasympathetic system kicks in and breathes for us. So we could be build That builds up anxiety when you're not consciously breathing so how you deactivate your parasympathetic system is you have to sit down and breathe consciously breathe in and out for a couple of minutes and that will activate your sympathetic system and then you will be able to feel better all right so be mindful of your breathing be mindful of how you feel and have a go-to way of calming yourself down you know here they suggest making a playlist or doing a crossword we talk about counting backwards from 90 from from 90 um, 89 88 87 all the way to one this is called the 90 second rule we have an episode on this the 90 second rule somehow deactivates the fight or flight mechanism or response because the brain somehow when it hears a countdown so you know your brain somehow you're counting down five four three two one it somehow calms down your mind and body and prepares it but it also relaxes you and it can take you out of that fight or flight response so just think about that something simple is sitting down breathing before you overreact or before you get too consumed with the thoughts and the rage and the sadness and the fear sit down and breathe right and really start counting backwards from 90 all right 
According to experts, anxiety is a primitive response, essentially a fight or flight reflex, which releases stress hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol. This can result in a physical effect such as increased heart rate, sweaty palms, or racing heart. Professor John says social media did not appear to be the blame for the rise of anxiety in adolescence. Research shows that we can't blame social media for this as it does have its plus size, such as reducing marginalization within some groups. She added that anecdotally, exam stress and climate change often caused anxiety among young people. Okay. Um, okay. And, um, also, steps to count anxiety include writing down your worries or talking to someone you trust, okay? Sleep and physical activity will help mental well-being as well as breathing exercises. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just so one of my friends online just posted something on Twitter and they said, um... Has your anxiety improved? And they put a poll up saying slightly, not at all, extremely, blah, blah, blah. And then he asks, well, what did you do? Um, what, what did you implement to help with your anxiety? And my response was simply, because my anxiety has been reduced lately. And the first thing I started to do was I started to be realistic about what I could control and what I could not control. All right. There's some things I'm just not going to be able to control. So if I had a bill that was due, I'm just giving you guys a random example. Let's say this bill was a three thousand dollar bill and I know it's due on the first. Right. And I know I only have twenty five hundred and I know there's probably no way I'm realistically going to come up with the extra five hundred by the first. I have to sit down and realistically say we have to find an alternate uh, alternate solutions. But what I can't do is sit here and stress and develop anxiety over something that I can't control. So the energy that I'll put in saying, oh, man, you know, damn, I know I got to pay this bill and I really don't want to be late. And I'm worrying about my credit and what's going to happen. And if that I have to say, well, let me call the company first and notify them that I'm not going to be able to make the full payment. That's being proactive, right? And then the second thing I'll do is say, well, let me just do an inventory with the family or friends and see if it's an extra 500 out there I could maybe be able to borrow. Or let me try to see if I get a delay or a payment extension. You see how I went from just feeling like I had nothing, not, there was nothing I could do into being proactive. So sometimes being proactive about your fear or your, or your anxiety can really help get you ahead of your stress. All right. The goal here is to get us ahead of the curve when it deals when come when dealing with stress. I mean, there's too many times where I sat there and felt helpless and I was like, well, I'm not really doing anything. Let me put together a plan. So sometime planning can really help. All right. Also, sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, if you are dealing with out of control anxiety, Look at your sleep patterns, all right? So this is very important. Try to change your sleep patterns. If you if you have out of control anxiety and you're not sleeping at the same time every night and waking up at the same time every day and you don't have a routine, that may be one of the causes. So what I would suggest is really looking seriously. This can make a difference. This helped me out a lot. Like about Two weeks ago, I was dealing with the holiday blues and I was really stressed. And I don't know what happened. One day I just said, you know what? I'm going to bed. And I went to bed at 10, 11 o'clock. I'm usually staying up to 12, 1. Whether I'm working on something, working on a book, working on a podcast, whether I'm working on music or I'm just watching TV. Usually I'm a, I'm a night owl by nature. But then I went to bed at 10 that day and I woke up at 7 a.m. And I got up and I said, you know what? I'm going to get up. I'm going to go do some stuff, get some coffee, run some errands. And I just shut everything off. I said, I can't control everything. I'm just shutting down and going to bed. And then the next day around 1030-ish, started to get a little bit tired. But I'm watching the show. And I started to say to myself, you know what? 
this show, Kuwait, it's more important that I get some sleep. And I just said, you know what? Go on to bed. And then I started to develop this new pattern where I went to bed and respected my circadian rhythms and I started to feel better. Because if you go to bed at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, then that's a lot of time that you don't have to be stressing and your body could repair itself. You feel better. And another thing I learned, ladies and gentlemen, that's extremely helpful for us in the mental health community is that if you have a problem that you can't solve, right? Your subconscious mind and your subconscious brain, your subconscious mind works on problems while you're sleeping. It it continuously works on a problem long after you forget about it. So, for example, in my example earlier, I have twenty five hundred, but I have to pay three thousand by the first. Right. That's a problem that's stressing me. I go to bed. My subconscious mind will continuously rack through my brain and and develop thought patterns that will assist me in solving that problem later. So this phenomenon is awesome because you guys will recognize this. You ever had a problem and then like a couple of days later you go, I got it. I got it. I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do. And it just seems to appear out of nowhere. That's because your subconscious mind was working behind the scenes to solve that problem. So... Mental health works in both ways, right? We have these neurotransmitter hormones that, you know, we need to have a healthy mind and they help us to make connections when we're sleeping, right? Your vital neurotransmitter hormones like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, these things really help us. Just like if they get too low, they could really hurt us because that's where we start to experience our depression. So remember, Go to bed early, respect your sleep because your brain will still develop and work on that problem while you're getting your restorative sleep. And I know that could help a lot of us because there's been many nights where I'll stay up to three o'clock in the morning ruminating and stressing about something that I have no control over, right? Just to have a bad night's sleep and to be stressed out and tired the next day, right? So my thing is definitely put yourself in perspective and try to really respect your sleep patterns to reduce your stress. So ladies and gentlemen, that's anxiety. I wanted to talk about that, why you were feeling anxious. Uh, I'll put the notes to the articles and the show notes. The next thing I want to touch on briefly um, is bereavement, a mental health issue. Is bereavement a mental health issue? Like someone dies, if you lose, if you have some loss, is that a mental health issue? So let's look at this. Professor Short said, I don't want to suggest that bereavement is not serious enough to cause significant distress, but I would not wish to medicalize it by calling it a mental health issue and suggesting to a person there is something wrong with them. Bereavement is a natural process that is due to loss. This might not be the loss of a person, but the loss of a loved pet, or it might be the loss of something else in your life, such as losing your job or your health and abilities due to an illness or disability. Low mood and sadness are a natural part of bereavement, but other emotions too can take place. Anger, feeling loss, and guilt. It's not necessarily the answer to take antidepressants for bereavement. Talking with a friend or counselor can be very helpful in working through these feelings. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is really deep. The doctor is playing it safe here by saying, and he's right, you know, if we have a loss, you're going to go through the natural response of grief, right? But in my case, like, when I lost my dad, I was really young. I was like 13 or 14. It was like the worst thing that could ever happen. Like, I prayed for weeks and months that this didn't happen. I just wanted him to go to the hospital and be okay. My dad was experiencing health symptoms and um, just for a very long time. 
it just seemed like it was something that could be inevitable and it was like a big fear and I was just like please God by any miracle please I just want to be 18 and 19 don't let him die when I'm 13 I'm so young I just said we all young I mean please I did every type of prayer it was the ultimate thing that I did not want to happen I just was praying for a miracle and then unfortunately my dad passed away right during that period it was like within a two or three week process for me within that month or two or whatever and it just happened and it was like my worst fear was upon me something that was totally just i I can't really just describe it i really can't but i would say this we all dealt with the um we dealt with it in our own ways right i'm 13 14 so i'm in eighth grade no seventh or eighth grade i don't remember you know so that's you know i grow up i get you know i get my growth spurt you know i get taller i start talking to girls and i'm going through life and then we somehow get through it and it's this like two or three year tough period everything in the house was really quiet and cold and we used to listen to michael jackson's history and seals um um kiss from a rose from the grave so my mom and i and the kids we would just my brothers and sisters we would play michael jackson carlos santana album uh maria maria um we used to play that michael jackson's history and seals album on repeat every night and have dinner We'll watch Martin, we'll watch Family Matters, Fresh Prince, we'll play Seal, we'll play it. And this is like this is like two or three years after the fact. This was like uh, I'm all, I'm in high school now and you know, um and I'm dealing with this bereavement and it's just like it really stuck with us for a very long time. I don't think losing a parent it takes time. So I'm saying all of that to say this. Yes, absolutely bereavement can be considered a mental health issue. Why? Because it could lead to anxiety and depression. It's that simple. But if you deal with grief and deal with the bereavement process appropriately, do not like suffocate your emotions. Don't try to play tough. Don't try to hide it and figure it out. Don't try to keep it inside you got to get these emotions out cry go through the grief fall apart be angry go to counseling go to your priest go to church pray mourn mourning your loved one in an appropriate way going to visit them writing about them putting pictures up remembering them throwing parties for their birthday loving them helps it never really gets easier but it starts to become more normal and when you really embrace all of the emotions you could get to a really healthy place the other thing about bereavement and loss that um, this article just helped me with, I never look at, looked at bereavement outside of the death of a loved one. I didn't know that losing your job could have bereavement issues. It, it deals with loss. Bereavement is like a... Like a um, think of it as a detachment or a surgical loss. Like somehow something out of in your life that's normal gets cut out of your life. Right? So it's a bereavement issue. It's like... That's real serious, so it could have an effect. So we may build attachment hormones to a person. We may have these neural bonds and these spiritual bonds and heart, love, emotional bonds with a person or a thing or a job or a pet. And when we lose that, it definitely takes its toll on us. Um, so for everyone out there, every day someone is being lost. I mean, with social media now, now we're being exposed to the reality of our mortality, right? You know, once a month, you're going to see someone, whether it's some, one of your extended friends, they might have a cousin or a childhood friend or somebody's passing away, right? That's life. And when we understand that, um, it helps. What also helped me, ladies and gentlemen, was having a healthy spirituality. So I started to understand, like, I would see my dad in my dreams. And that gave me hope because he would come to me in a unique way. And he, it was like he, my dad was revealing him, himself to me. Like, I remember one time my dad came back to me and I was, he was younger than I remember him. He was like in his 20s and he was a salesman. 
And he came and got me and he gave me a suit and he said, I'm going to take you door to door and show you how to do sales. And I looked at him and said, Dad, you look so cool, man. You look young. You look so young. We look like brothers. And he was like, yeah, yeah, come on. I'm going to teach you. And for the whole dream, my dad went door to door to door to door and he taught me how to sell. And I. I right after that I got into real estate. I was really good at it, made a lot of money, and that gave me hope. I said, "Look, my dad came to me with these new suits. He looked different. We had real conversations. He encouraged me to not to be sad. He told me he loved me. Then I started to believe that there was life after death." All right, because my brain, I don't think would produce all of that. I think it was a spiritual component of love that allows our loved ones to reach out to us at some point to give us a sign that they're still living. And I wouldn't have been able to really comprehend that dream and all of these emotions if I didn't have a strong sense of spirituality, if I didn't understand God or love God, if I didn't believe in life after death. So my thing is, if you're dealing with bereavement or some form of loss, have faith Find some faith, find something for you, find a higher power or something that can help you. Because ladies and gentlemen, I used to, like I said, there's no atheist in a foxhole. You know, when I was looking down on the possible death and losing my life due to my addiction, I just instinctively gravitated right back to God. It was like automatic, you know, it was like I knew something greater than me. I was like, God help me, right? And I didn't do that up to that point. So keep that in mind um, as far as anxiety and bereavement. OK, um, ladies and gentlemen, look, I just wanted to touch on something short and sweet for you guys to put things in perspective. Mental health is going to be an ongoing thing, especially if you're dealing with um, addiction especially if you're a human being i think that mental health has a mental uh, a negative connotation associated with it and it does i mean mental health could be a lot of things happiness is a mental health um thing i mean i think just like every time you hear mental health it's all negative but there's ha there's very positive aspects just like someone could be depressed someone could be ex extremely happy and confident and uh, and excited all right just like someone can be in bereavement someone could be in total sh um awe and 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 um appreciation for a newborn child and that could release really beautiful hormones like dopamine and stuff the same hormones that causes depression are the same hormones is going to make us feel extremely excited so we have to respect both sides of the spectrum we have to appreciate positive mental health um aspects just as as much as we got to recognize that people may struggle from this but ladies and gentlemen i will say this mental health is something we can't combat together and you don't have to suffer it or go it alone like they say with addiction you don't have to go it alone if you're dealing with mental addiction and ask for help and use google research it if you have symptoms say look what are these symptoms i have do i may I, do i may i might suffer do i suffer from this and then maybe look into psychotherapy a psychiatrist a psychologist someone a therapist right in 2020 i i want us to look into therapy i want us to look into meditation get into spirituality if you're someone who has not given god a shot or prayer or finding a higher power read all of the spiritual books find out what resonates with you right don't make it so much of an intellectual thing. I think people take religion and God and spirituality as this intellectual process where it's all in the dogma. I try to bypass a lot of that because when you're on your deathbed, you don't care about which verse in the Bible was right and which version or if the Catholics or the Protestants was right or if if the if if the if a Muslim was right over a Hindu person or nobody cares. It's one word word is one name we're gonna all call in our final hour it's gonna be god and that could be anything that you need it to be right i'm not gonna sit here and try to tell you that god has to be this to you but my thing is don't undercut yourself by ruling that out 
because I had friends who just never wanted to give religion or God a shot. And they just did that their whole life until they was about 50 or 60. And then they just was like, bro, one day I was just walking. I saw this miracle and I totally believe in God. Like, this is real. And it changed my life. And I don't know why I was so closed up before. Um, so just keep that in mind. I'm not here to convert you guys into anything, right? I'm just saying as far as mental health, don't cut off the power of the higher power, right? As you may know that higher power to be. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Sober's Dope Podcast. I am so excited to bring you some cool information today. I love you. I'll catch you on the other side. Let's keep the dialogue going. And no matter what, take care of yourself, love yourself, and be honest with yourself. And forgive yourself a break.